are never enough. But you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in
faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proved you just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. Let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me.
worship team here. Um, we have a few things going around uh, on campus coming up. In this space at 1215, there is a potluck Bible study led by Reverend Kinnon on the Holy Land and the things we'll be doing there. It's an open invite for anyone who's interested to come. On September 14th through the 17th, there's a women's walk to Emmaus. I've never been, and I don't really know much about it, but I know people who do. So if you're interested in going on that, just get with me and I'll direct you to who to talk to. Um, on September 8th, in this space, the gym and the parking lot will be having a tailgate themed event. It's ticketed and it's a fundraiser for our trip to Israel coming up very soon. And then Reverend Kinnon and Ian will be leading a Bible study on Thursday night starting September 7th at 6 o'clock. Miss Camille, would you like to come forward? Miss Camille is the finance chair here at Blackwater, and she's going to give us a little bit of an update on where we are with our Center for Enrichment. Thank you. Center for Enrichment, Blackwater Center, it has a lot of names, but the fundraising campaign is called Growing Hope, the Growing Hope campaign. And as the current chair of the finance committee, I'm just going to give you a status update of where we are today. Um, you know, our goal has been $600,000 um, to be used for improvements to our existing facilities like aging roofs and air conditioners and the Blackwater Center also, which involves renovating and repurposing the gym so it serves more of our needs. You know, before Kenan arrived and became our pastor, church leadership went through a transformation process where we had to discern the next steps necessary toward greater fruitfulness and vitality of this church. Many of us spent a lot of time identifying the church's strengths and opportunities. We agreed that our purpose is to make disciples. Yeah. Our mission field is families with children under 18 years old. And our goals are to build relationships become like Jesus and not just learn about him. The Blackwater Center is right in line with this. So our financial goal is $600,000 over a three-year period. Our pledges thus far total just over $400,000 for the three years. Of that, we have received just over $100,000 in collections and that includes the $35,000 grant from the United Methodist Foundation in support of this effort. We are now moving out of the public fundraising phase and I've been asked why. Well, you can of course still donate, but we have to know how much money is going to come in and about when it's going to come in during the three year period so that the work can be planned. A committee has been formed to oversee this project and the finance committee will prioritize the spending. We will only spend monies we receive so there will be no debt associated with this project. So know that we will live within our means and right size the project and let's pray we receive more pledges for this worthy cause. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Camille, and all your hard work that's going into right-sizing that project for us. We have now come to the offering portion of our service here today, and I would like to remind you that there are several different ways that you can give to growing the kingdom of God, and that is through your prayers, your presence, your service, your witness, and your gifts. If you are a first-time guest with us here today, please do not feel pressure to give. This is our gift to you. We are so happy you are here. Thank you.
get to read scripture to us today. We're in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. When the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel, and until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. Then the conspirators came to the king and said to him, Know, O king, that it is law of the Medes and the Persians that no interdict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi, y'all. I'm Pastor Kennan. It's great to see you. And uh, I'm on a regular microphone because I broke my headset. Darn it, last week. I'm getting another one, though. Yeah, that's what happened. So, it's all right. We're all good. So, uh, we are uh, in a sermon series called We Are Lions. And uh, I'm really uh, excited about continuing this with you today. Um, because uh, I think it's so important in our faith that um, as we explore and as we discover the hidden truths that God reveals to us, I think it's really critical that we pay super close attention uh, to that. And um, I think that's true of any really good exploration, paying close attention. And it reminds me of when I took a trip to Kenya, Africa, and I was out in the Masai Amara. I've talked a little bit about this in this series uh, because it's the only time that I've spent some, like, face-to-face -face time with lions, real ones. And so uh, out there, they, we had a wilderness guide, and boy, was I glad that he was there. Let me tell you, because it's kind of like being in a zoo without the fences and walls. So it's a little scary. Um, and so the Pride Land, though, it had um, some really diverse landscape. And this guide really helped us kind of get some good nuggets and, and learn a lot of stuff. And um, there was, you know, the setting itself, which was really cool. There was like bushes and trees, not like the ones here. Uh, they were real scruffy and scraggly. And there were rocks and grass and high grass that you couldn't see what was in it. Um, there were um, uh, all kinds of things, but it really was kind of the perfect setting for exploring. You know, it was kind of exciting. And so you'd be surprised at how much one could learn just by kind of lifting up a rock. Something that simple, you know, you would get all kinds of information from. And so we went to this one rock, and the guy turned it over, and it was cool because right there, there was this hidden burrow. Like some creature lived in there, right, and had dug this hole. And so it was very interesting because he couldn't really tell exactly which creature it was, but he kind of used his, his reason to kind of reason it out. It wasn't a porcupine because there were no quills around the area. And so he thought that maybe it was either like an aardvark or maybe even like a burrowing owl of some kind. And so I thought that was interesting. But that discovery was just one example of like all of the intricacy and the interconnectedness of the ecosystem there. He turned over another stone and he showed us this fossil and it was weird. It was kind of like this ancient like x-ray on a tablet instead of a screen, you know, and you could look in it and you could tell that there was some kind of aquatic mammal there at some point, but like there was no water within sight. And so this was like an ancient snapshot of something that once was, but was no longer. But you could tell from just that stone that there was this like rich history um, as the world evolved over years and years and years, uh, how, um, how the changes had occurred. And so uh, as we continued rolling over these stones, we uh, learned all kinds of things, stuff about insects like beetles and ants and termites and even scorpions uh, and the different kinds of them. And I was amazed at how even the little tiniest creatures worked to stabilize this incredible Masai Mara uh, place. It was, it was just really, really cool. They maintained the balance. And so we tracked footprints, and we gained insight about animal migrations and understanding their behavior. We looked at gems and minerals from, from um, around the uh, sites. And looking back on that, on that experience... I believe that God showed me something that really relates to today's message because I began to think about how God also gives us divine signs and wonders here. 
when we look closely in the Bible and helps us to unearth like some hidden treasures and some gems and some greater understanding with God's guidance. In fact, our spiritual journeys, they're very much like how that Savari guide unveil, unveiled uh, hidden things under the rocks. And uh, I believe that God is wanting us to discover that too, gems of wisdom and insight and revelation from today's word. Revelation within ourselves, revelation about the world around us. And I believe that God guides us to look under the stones of our own lives and look under the stones of our own context and keep in mind all of those things I've said as we engage this word. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. Thank you for its truths. Thank you for its example. God, may it find us ready to hear and be attentive. God, may, may it, Lord, search us deeply. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So I want you to imagine that we're on our own little journey, our own little safari together through the Bible here. Only we're not in the Pride Lands. We're here in Central or Baker or whatever we want to call it, the surrounding area. And I want you to feel like we're in the spirit of Daniel here in this story, that we're on a transformative journey. And the one that we're about to pursue is one about being lion tamed, self-control. An informed exploration where we unlock the treasures God has for us of, about resiliency, about integrity, and about the discipline that we need within ourselves. The stones that I believe that God has led us to look under this morning are the stones of when we don't take a stand for things. When we don't take a stand. Times that lead us to regrets or even worse, complacency. I like to call this the stone of do nothing, nothing changes. If you don't look under this stone, you don't grow. You don't understand anything any deeper because you didn't do anything. So nothing happens, nothing changes. You don't change. If you just walk in here and we never look at this word deeply together, <laughs> nothing changes. We're not transformed. We leave here the same, feeling the same as when we walked in. That's complacency. Jesus He's very clear about it. Spits out of the mouth. God doesn't want lukewarm, right? Have you ever been there, though? Are you there now? Sometimes a, a monotony can develop in our lives. Sometimes a humdrum grind can take effect. You ever seen that movie Groundhog Day? <laughs> Bill Murray? He just lives the same. It's the most obnoxious movie. I can't, it drove me crazy. It, his day keeps starting over and over and over and over. And he just lives the same day over and over. So maybe under this rock, the rock of do nothing, nothing changes, you find an entrance to the groundhog's burrow, right? You've heard it said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results, Right? Well, I think the same thing can be said for doing nothing. Do nothing, nothing changes. It's insane. I want you to think about some of the things that happen right under our noses, right under our noses. Political polarization has happened, hasn't it? No one can have a, an unspirited political discussion anymore because they're worried about offending, right? The political process, the process that's supposed to be fair and balanced and give a representation of the diversity of the people, right? A voice for us. Weaponizing of courts. Tying up millions of dollars and times and resources. A place where justice is supposed to happen. A place where the right things are supposed to happen. What about hot-headed parents at children's sporting events? Oh, come on. You know it's true. Where the police get called. A place where we are supposed to be instilling good sportsmanship into our children. 
and setting an example of what it means to be a good sport. What about our schools that struggle to facilitate, to teach our children because no one can agree on what the standards are and what we should be expecting of our children? I'm sure that we can think of many other things that have been normalized right under our noses. And we've either been lulled into accepting these things as normal life in 2023, or we're complicit with them. We do nothing, and so nothing changes. Here's another stone I believe that God would have us look under today. How about the stone of give up instead of stand up? You know, it's easier to give up. Doesn't take any energy. Does it invite any unwanted drama? <laughs> Does it risk any rebuke or any rejection, right? Standing up requires energy. Let's be honest, energy that we would feel like we don't have because we're so taxed. Standing up, it risks conflict. It means, oh, there's enough of that already, right? We want to add to it. Standing up may even mean that we uh, threaten certain relationships that we have. Like we need any more changes, right? There's been enough of that in the world at breakneck speed. This word we receive, though, today isn't inviting us to cause trouble for the sake of trouble. It's not, causing, it's not asking us to defy the laws of the land and disrupt the peacekeeping of our land. It's inviting us to know that sometimes we have to come to a place where we look at our relationship with God and our relationship with the world and we ask ourselves really important questions. Is it a battle that we should choose? And sometimes, friends, the answer is yes. It really is. It's yes. God's righteousness, as Daniel shows us, is worth the fight and the civil disruption. He goes and he prays in the window <laughs> where everybody can see him, even though a decree has been issued by the king not to pray. He does it in plain sight. And let me tell you, this is a powerful story. A story of a man with unwavering faith. One who is set to encounter lions in a lion's den. It's dangerous. But it presents a crucial moment today when Daniel's integrity and his discipline and his defiance, they face a really severe testing in this story, in this moment. And it showcases his unparalleled integrity. Integrity that we're called to as Christians. He defies the king's decree because of his deep personal devotion to God. And he continued his regular practice of prayer. And his integrity, well, it was intertwined with his commitment to live a life, a life that shows that God is worthy to be praised. He prioritized his relationship with God above earthly authorities. Even ones that threatened his safety. This is an exceptional story. The narrative today, it offers a powerful message. A message about standing up for justice. A message about maintaining personal integrity. About staying true to one's beliefs. Even in the face of adversity. If you're seeking any kind of deeper meaning in your life today... As your spiritual leader, God is asking you to look within yourself and look at who God made you to be, an authentic ruler with integrity. That's what God made you, a lion of a person in charge of the created world. That's what God made you. God is your safari guide here. And you have the power to rule it. You even have the power as a Christian to toggle between the physical world and the supernatural world. You even have the power to call down authority from heaven and establish God's kingdom and God's kingdom authority right here, right now. You have the power to manifest partially the kingdom of God now. 
And I believe God is using this story to show you the resilience unveiled in this wilderness. Just like I saw the remarkable resilience of the wildlife on the safari I went on. Enduring challenges like drought and like predators and like changing environments. God is showing you and me how to develop our own resilience in the face of adversity. Being lion tamed, though, you see that? That encourages us to persevere, to bounce back from setbacks, to remain steadfast in our faith and in our values. I hear God encouraging you and me to stay true to our core values, to stay true to our principles, regardless of external pressures, regardless of expectations that are heaped on us. Because by doing so, we can build lives that align with our deepest convictions, fostering greater, greater self-respect and a sense of moral strength. You see, Daniel's life, it was marked by discipline, even when he faced consequences. God is showing us how to have integrity in the wild of Central, and in the wild of Baker, and the surrounding area. Showing you and me that being lion tamed calls us to cultivate a similar integrity in our own personal lives. Where our actions and our words align with our deeply held values. Fostering authenticity and trustworthiness. I believe that God is guiding you and me to discover our deeper meaning by finding courage even in the face of injustice. God is telling us to stand up against it. God wants us to find the inner strength to challenge oppressive systems, to fight for what is right, and to advocate for justice and equality. I believe that God is leading us to resilience and trust. God showed us the power of trusting in something greater through Daniel, even in the midst of adversity. We're invited to draw on our inner strength, to persevere through difficulties. And to remind us that there's a greater purpose in our lives. Even when we struggle to see it. God is taking us to a place of empathy and of solidarity. Here's the deal. On safari... The missionaries and I, we witness the discipline of the lions and their hunting techniques and in their group dynamics and in their territorial behaviors and all of those things. And I believe that God is showing our church today that being lion tamed calls us to embody discipline in our own lives. Staying committed to our values, making very intentional choices and nurturing and exercising self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. We now have several generations of households in our community that do not know God. 28% in Louisiana. And we lead. The nation is 23% that profess any religious affiliation. And you know what? That fact spills out in really ugly ways leadership in our community, denying bus drivers and teachers support, self-serving politicians looking for power and to get rich. What a double standard we set when bus drivers, teachers, and other public servants are expect to survive in a system designed so that they can barely keep their heads above water, while at the same time we vote into power unscrupulous, dirty politicians who don't have anyone's best interest but their own. Do nothing, nothing changes. It is time for good leaders of the church to step up to the plate and take us somewhere new and different. I should have the right to have my Christian values reflected in our politics. <laughs> I should have that right. That means we need good, new Christian leadership. And that means our church needs to develop it. Who's going to do it if we don't? Nobody. It's our work to do. It's our work to persevere in. It's our work to dedicate ourselves to. 
it's easy to get caught up in pettiness around here, squabbles and little, eh. But I'm telling you now, the people who perpetuate that just need prayer. Here's what I want us to invest our time and energy in instead. How about nurturing and growing in our faith so that we have the potential to positively impact not only our community, but perhaps even the world. You know who can make world changers? This church can make world changers. You don't believe me? Well, let me tell you what can come out of Central. Let me set an example for you about amazing things coming out of weird little places. Nothing good came out of Nazareth, right? <laughs> oh, just Jesus Christ. <laughs> Bethlehem wasn't even on the map. But guess what? Mary and Joseph and Jesus put Bethlehem on the map. The map of ancient kings from afar. <laughs> Royalty. We can produce world changers right here. We absolutely can. What about the discipline of standing up to the things that have been normalized? Well, guess what? What if we vote out unfair and unbalanced politicians who don't protect us and we vote ones in? I've got one even better. What if we raise them right here <laughs> and then vote them in? Mm -hmm. It's a long-term plan. It's a long-term play. It's an investment of this church into the long term of our community. It is a bullseye on our mission statement to pass down our faith from one generation to the next. Put that in power. I want my kids to grow up in a world where they know Jesus Christ and not three out of four don't. What if we refuse to weaponize our systems and institutions and instead, we work towards creating a more perfect union. It's our country. What if we expect kind, loving parents at children's sporting events? And what if the church takes back sport leagues and we call behavior unacceptable and unwanted? <laughs> I don't want some hot-headed dad being arrested in front of my kid while they're trying to learn baseball. And I don't want my kid practicing on Sunday either. What? Yeah, I said it. I said it. What if we expect loving parents? What if we use our gym for that? <laughs> and by the way, what if we expect kind and loving people in our pews and at our tables? How many more people might be attracted to the Lord? How many more? It's about them. The ones that don't know. You're lucky. You're one out of four. There are three out of four who are not here. Don't make that be because of you. Don't make that be because you were complicit. Don't make that be because you did nothing. Stand up. You're lions. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
Holy God, pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and juice and make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ. That we may be the body of Christ, one with him, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. Till one day we sit and feast at your heavenly banquet forever. All honor and glory given to you, to your son, by the power of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite those forward. I'd like to invite forward those who are going to prepare our elements, and as they do, just remember that this is the Lord's table. Nothing we do earns this grace. It's not free grace. It's not cheap grace. It's expensive grace, but it's paid for grace by Jesus Christ. All are welcome. Won't you come? Thank you, Lord. Y'all stand and sing. Praise the Lord. Let's make some noise for the Lord. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. The sins went as impossible. Never stopped you. Friday's disappointment. Sunday's empty too. Impossible ever stopped you. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise makes a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Fire, spirits 